I remember the first moment when I became completely blown away and intrigued with the idea of being a magician. That was the moment that I knew that I could actually be good at this. It is the most fun thing in the world to me. I tend to like questions a lot more than answers. And what a magic trick does is it forces you into a place of questioning and it pulls the rug of reality out from underneath you to where you're literally left in a place where you don't know what is happening. As a magician, you're very skeptical and you realize that most of what's going on behind the scenes is fake or false. The idea of an all-powerful God seems incredibly silly. And when I talk to people that would go to church, I can remember thinking that they were just falling for a simple magic trick. It's like the Wizard of Oz behind the curtain controlling everything. I'd grown up understanding how to make people believe something was real when it was really not. I am a master of phoniness. I'm a, I'm a charlatan by craft. But I began to ask myself the big God question. I said, God, if you are real, then I need you to bring me back behind the curtain. I need you to show me how it works. And I need you to make this so real to me that I cannot ignore it. never forget the day this man walks into my room and he said, Mr. Monroe, I don't know how to tell you this, but you have, you have cancer. I said, what? And he looked at me and he said, Mr. Monroe, he said, we cannot cure you of your disease. My wife and I were we were in a bad place. God, where are you? I guess you aren't that great. I had been married for five years. I had just a three-year-old girl and a two-year-old little boy. And I needed, I needed more time with my family. I needed more time. The cancer doctor looked at me and said, Mr. Monroe, he said, we cannot cure you of your disease. And there is something, however, that we would like to try. It's called a bone marrow transplant. The problem with your body is that your white blood cells are making bad copies of bad copies. Your body is deceiving itself. It's playing a trick on itself. So what we need to do is we need to completely destroy your system. And what we're hoping to do is we're hoping to find someone in the world whose DNA matches yours close enough to grow a brand new immune system, a brand new blood system from scratch. We're gonna substitute someone else's perfect blood on your behalf so that you can live again. I was thinking to myself, man, my time is running out. I am dying of cancer. It's been hard to deal with right now. Peyton is three years old and Gavin is two years old. My two babies. Should this take my life early? I love you. They began the most vicious concoction of chemo. The goal of which was not just to destroy the cancer in my body, but was literally to destroy me. It was hell. It was a slow death. I really am scared. I'm really trying not to be fearful, but I am fearful. I'm trying to be strong for my wife and for my, for my family. But uh, I'm pretty scared. We are waiting to hear from the National Bone Marrow Donor Program. Seven million people currently registered on the database. And there was one perfect match for me. 
just one. It was a 19-year-old female. They said, Mr. Monroe, your bone marrow transplant is scheduled for April 23rd. You're gonna get a brand new birthday. They said, you are gonna be like a baby inside the womb all over again. The nurses celebrate your new birth in the hospital. And I had heard that terminology before too, somewhere at the churches that I had attended. But literally, I was gonna be born anew. And then I'll never forget, on April 23rd, they brought this bag of blood into my room and everyone was hoping in that moment that my body would receive that new life, that new blood. I sit here today, 100% completely cancer free. And when they look at my blood today, they see a 19 year old female. They see her, they see XX chromosome. And I'm reminded of a verse in Galatians 2. It says, uh, it's no longer I who live, but it's someone else who lives on the inside of me. And the life that I now live, I live by faith. Save my life. Oh, really? Yeah, that's awesome. Save my life. I almost died of leukemia. She, she can go to the John 17, 3, it says, this is eternal life, knowing you, God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I'm fully convinced of the claims of Jesus as a skeptical person and as an illusionist. I know that the God of the universe has brought me back behind the curtain just like I asked him to. Cancer was how he did it through my life. And there's a spiritual cancer that's eating us away on the inside. And we're all longing, we're all begging for someone to step in and to save us from that condition. Well, that's one of my favorite videos, by the way. Um, being a magician and um, I used to be a member of the Magic Castle, and when I heard about his testimony, total atheist, doesn't believe in God, confronts God on a level of, okay, let's prove this thing, and then God sends him through that. His testimony is interesting because, let me tell you this, um, I wasn't going to do this sermon today. I do this every once in a while. God catches me off guard. And you know me. I put my sermons together five minutes before I get up here. But today, I had this one ready. I had a sermon ready for today. Prepared. And then I'm sitting back there today, and God's like, no. Remember your video about the atheist guy? He goes, play that video. So if you're online, if you're here, I, you don't need to let me know, but I, I'm always intrigued. God, why did you get me to switch this? this? This message that I had for today, I was like, dude, I really wanted to do that one. It was such a good story. But you know what? I have a commander in chief, a Lord, a God who tells me what to do, and um, I pray if you're online and you're watching this, um, and we record it, so even if it's years from now, um, just um, send me a message. Say, yeah, that day you changed that, that was God talking to me. Very seldom do I get somebody to come up and say that, but um, it, it is neat when it happens. So what I want to do is I have atheist friends, and it's true. Christians can be friends with atheists. Um, and that's okay. Um, the, th the difference is some people get in arguments with their atheist non-believers. I don't. I love talking to them because 99% of atheists don't even know why they believe what they believe. They believe it because somebody else told them, and there's nothing to back it up. In fact, there's probably about 15 things that all atheists say, 
and they bring those same arguments. And if they would take the time, which I do with the people that I, if you're online, if you're here, if you don't believe in God, spend time with me. I have friends who are scientists. I have enough connections, enough research that can downplay almost everything that you probably believe about not believing in God. But I'm not going to do that today. Because I'm not saying everybody here is an atheist. I'm just saying, here's my, here's my thing. Just like Jim Monroe did. He went to God. Even though he didn't believe in God, he went to God. There was a point where he finally had to make a decision. And this is the thing that I tell people. If you do not believe in God because of something that your professor said at college... Think about that. Your professor. Or maybe your high school or elementary school teacher who was teaching science and just started talking about these weird numbers, these things that would be harder to believe in than believing in God himself. Because out of nothing created everything. That's what they teach. Out of nothing, everything exists. Do the math on that one. What's zero plus zero? Or... Out of a big bang. Everybody like the big bang? You know, there was a big bang. Put everything in perfect order that today you can get on there and Google it. When is the sun going to rise 50 years from now? You know we know that. Go to, go to NASA and look at all the things that they have on their calendar about the things that are going to take place years from now. Why is that? Because it's perfect order. Perfection. Everything works perfectly that you can say, what time is the sun going to rise? Many years from now. What time is it going to set? Many years from now. Chaos, explosions do not create that. It takes a creator. So I wanted to... Um, Bring back, uh, for, the, for the people online especially, because I know we get a lot of atheists online, and I, get, I, I have the joy of talking to them. It's never an argument. In fact, it, it always started out like this. This is, my, this is my conversation with most atheists that I talk to. If I was to give you the proof that you need, would you be willing to at least listen to it? Doesn't mean you have to accept it. But we're, I'm not here to argue. An argument is stupid. Neither one of us is going to win. It's just a waste of time. But if you're willing to listen, I'm willing to say, because most of the stuff that atheists have heard is completely wrong. In fact, they call our stuff a fairy tale. <laughs> Christians have this fairy tale. Let me tell you about this fairy tale. This fairy tale of believing in Jesus Christ has changed the world. Do you understand that? All nations have been affected by the story of Jesus. The Bible, number one, top selling book for all time. The miracles that are in it not only are portrayed in the scripture, but are proven within our own lives. That's what Jim Monroe found out. Not only does the miracles happen in those pages of that Bible, it happens within our lives. So if you do not believe in God, you, have, you should do some research. What's the book, Case for Christ? Is that the book and movie? You know he was an atheist. He went out to prove. He was um, a reporter for, it wasn't New York Times. What was it? Chicago Tribune, thanks. They said it back there, echoed here, up to me, thank you. He was an atheist, and as um, an investigative reporter, he went out to prove that God did not exist because his wife started believing in that fairy tale stuff. And he went out to prove it, and prove it, and prove it, and he started doing research. He started getting other friends who were also atheists and coming together, and then all of a sudden, his atheist friends had to leave him because he started believing that stuff because he said there's no way there's no way 
number one reason that I heard that he finally started taking some thought into this as he researched the apostles. See, if you're going to be an atheist, at least study what you don't believe. At least find out what you're not believing in because if you're wrong and millions and millions and millions of people are right, because you, you, your professor at school, your high school teacher, that's where you get your information. Or some guy on YouTube. Do your own research. Start finding out the truth. I just watched a movie. What did we go to, um, Dan? It was called Noah, Ark in, Dark, Ark in the Darkness. It's not out there now. You're going to have to research. You're going to have to find it. Oh, my goodness. These scientists have proven stuff in the Bible that science will not teach in schools because it totally backs up the Bible. So you have to go do your research and find these things. In fact, they had to pay for the movie theaters for a short term because, you know, movie theaters aren't going to carry this stuff on their own, so they have to pay for it individually. So if you're going to be an atheist and you're going to um, say, or, or if you have an atheist friend and you want to talk to him about Jesus Christ, first of all, do not tell them stuff in the Bible because they don't believe it. So why start there? Start with science. Science. Science proves God. I know colleges, high schools, they don't want to tell you this, but seriously, they go together. You know another thing that almost every atheist says this to me? They, all, they typically say this to me. Well, you Christians, you believe in the fairy, fairy tale story. You probably still believe the world is flat. <laughs> uh, you know the Bible has never, ever said that the world is flat. You know that? There may have been some Christians that said that. Maybe so. There's a lot of Christians that say a lot of stuff that's not in the Bible. It's only God's word that I go by. I don't go by what other Christians or other people say. In fact, if you do, you're crazy. <laughs> you go by the Bible, what God's word said. And the, God's word actually says that the, 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 the earth is round. It says it's a sphere. That's what God's word says. So all these atheists, as soon as they say that, I'm just like, all right, let's look up the scripture. Come on, you want to show what the, what, where in the Bible does it say it? I can show you where it doesn't say it. <laughs> I can show you where it says it's a sphere. Next thing I'll tell you is, let's start from what the Bible says. Then once you get past that science, all the scientific stuff that they're on, and let's go right down to what, a case for Christ, and many other atheists have come to know. The Bible isn't the only one that tells the history of, the, of Jesus and the apostles. There's other people that wrote about these people. So if you don't believe in the Bible, read these other history books. You know what it talks about? It talks about the apostles, and here's how it goes. They're following Jesus for about three years. They're learning about how he lives on this earth, and they're expecting him to be some warrior, some guy that's going to have a military force that's going to come in and take over the world. And that's not what happened. Jesus came here just like a lamb, um, was slaughtered on a cross, and died. Every one of them left Jesus to die. Not one and this is very important when you study the Bible, when you read scripture, when you read the history books, and you, not one stayed and stood up for Jesus Christ. You hear what I'm saying? Not one stayed. Do you know the, do you know the mentality or the, the cowardness maybe of these men? That they ran during, while they, were just, while they were beating Jesus all the way to the point of murder. They were cowards. They weren't as brave as Peter was saying, hey, I don't know about these guys, but I'll be right there with you. <laughs> yeah, you ran from a servant girl. Think about that. A servant girl came up to Peter and said to him, hey, you're with that guy, right? You're with Jesus. He goes, no, huh, no. This is not even a soldier, like a Roman soldier. This is a servant girl. Yeah, that happened about three times. All the other ones fled. And then something interesting happened. Jesus raises from the dead. 
this fairy tale story gets really weird. This guy who was dead for three days raises from the dead, comes in and talks to them, and something even better, he eats with them, which means he was legitimately back to life. He wasn't just a spirit or a figment of their imagination. He ate with them. Doubting Thomas, as we call him, said, hey, you guys may have seen him, but until I put my finger into his side and I see those holes in his hands, I'm not going to. And then as the room is locked up, Jesus walks in and goes, Thomas, you want to put your finger in my side? <laughs> and then he calls him Lord God. Most atheists don't believe this part because it's in the Bible, but I'm going to go ahead and tell you, uh, uh, just if you're going to be an atheist and not believe, let's look at the history of these guys. Like I said, they were just cowards as Jesus is dying on that cross. They're cowards. They're running. They're not strong men. Until the day he returns, when he comes back to life, from that point on, they realize that they were serving a true and living God. This is why... This is reasons that finally it clicks with people. Wait a minute. These cowardly men who were afraid to die are now proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ from that day forward, not worrying if they are beaten, they go to prison, or they um, are in chains, or they're put to death. All of a sudden, they are strong, courageous men. What happened? What changed? Let me tell you what changed. For one, if it was a fairy tale and if it wasn't true, you would not die for it. Jesus died. He's in a tomb. And then we made up this story about how we took, took his body and hid it. And we said, oh, he's back to life. If that was really true, that they hid his body, do you think that they would put their life and their family's life in jeopardy? Not going to happen. There's nobody in their right minds as these guys were in there. They had families. They had lifestyle. They had jobs. These guys were living good lives. And all of a sudden, they're willing to say, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who you killed on that cross, has risen from the dead. And to be saved, you must repent of your sins and confess your sins. They're saying that until the day they die. They're saying that even though their family was going to be attacked, even though they were thrown in prison, look at the life of these men. They were martyrs. In fact, now this is not in the Bible. This is in one of the history books. It actually says as Peter's wife was going to um, be murdered because of their beliefs, he was shouting out to her encouragement encouraging her as she goes through this torment. They're going to kill Peter just shortly after that. And the way that we hear it in the history, read it in the history books, he was hung upside down. I don't know that that's true, but I do know that he was put to death because of his belief. Let me tell you, at any moment that somebody comes to harm my family and I hid some man named Jesus so that you couldn't find him just to make this story of great story as soon as you go after my family you can damage me and maybe I'll hang in there but you go after my family I want to say hey dude we made this whole thing up man we made the whole story up but none of them said that you know why because it wasn't made up they were willing to die for the truth they saw when Jesus rose from the dead they realized who Jesus was they realized the truth but if you don't believe that, then you go to these stories that Jesus did throughout the scripture. Jesus, whenever he was walking here, you need to find, if you're going to not believe in Jesus, you need to find um, why you don't believe in him. But you need to find people that have been in a situation like Jim Monroe who have went through something where they had an encounter with Jesus. For example, if you look in the um, book of Luke chapter 8, there's um, some mention there of Jairus, um, Jairus. Uh, Jairus, it was maybe the right pronunciation. You say it the way you want to. Um, his daughter was dying, and he went to Jesus, and he said, Lord, I know that you can save my daughter, and she's sick, and she's going to die. And at that exact same time, 
this woman who had a blood issue for 12 years. Now, it's interesting that his daughter was 12 years old and dying, and she had this blood disease that she was dying, and she spent all her money on the medical field, and she saw Jesus walking by, and she said, if I can just touch Jesus' just the hem of his garment, I know that I'll be healed. So at the same time, these two things are going on. And as soon as she reaches out, she touches the hem of his garment. This big crowd is around Jesus because he's very popular at this time. And then uh, they're all around there and Jesus just stops. He says, who touched me? All the apostles and everybody around goes, what do you mean who touched me? Who touched me? There's all these people. They're all touching you. He goes, no, somebody touched me. And they were healed. This lady who wasn't supposed to be that close to people because of the blood issue and um, uh, the, uh, the fact that anything uh, like that you were supposed to stay away from the crowds, she had broken the law. But she got right there and she touched him. All of a sudden, Jesus turns around and she goes, it's me. I did it. You know what he said? He yelled at her, screamed at her. Why would you touch me for? You know you had this blood issue. No, he didn't. You know what he did? He's done something that probably hasn't been done for her in 12 years since she's had this disease. Because no one, family members and all, cannot come close to her because she would contaminate them. That was the law of the land. He turned to her and said, daughter, you are healed. Daughter. He called her in. She's part of the family. She's completely healed. At the same time, Jairus is sitting there. He's like, my daughter's dying. In fact, these people come up and say, hey, don't worry him anymore. Your daughter is dead. What? What kind of Jesus is this? They spent time with this, this lady and then they're going to ignore my daughter. That's not what Jairus said. In fact, Jesus turns to him and goes, just have faith. See, if you're going to be an atheist, study these stories. Find out what the truth is in these stories. Are they all fairy tales? Are they all made up? All of a sudden, he goes to Jairus' house, and just like this, there's some people out there weeping because of this child's death. And Jesus goes, stop weeping. She's not dead. She's just asleep. And they all started mocking her. You know what? If you're going to be a believer in Jesus Christ, and you're going to have faith, and you're going to follow him, guess what? The crowd's going to mock you for doing it. They're going to say, hey, that fairy tale story, just stand tall and firm. Because guess what? Salvation, truth, never fails. Jesus walked into that house, and he said to that little girl, get up. She gets up. She says, hey, feed this little girl. <laughs> Give her some food. You know what? Jesus did some amazing miracles. There's a blind man that people came up to him. I mean, it was, he, Jesus healed him. And then they start questioning, like, hey, this Jesus, he healed on the Sabbath, and he did this, and he did that. And this blind man looks right at him and goes, I don't know about all your religious stuff. And I'm adding these words to it. This is the way the conversation goes in my mind. I don't know about all your religious stuff and all these things that you're throwing out there, but I know this. I was blind, and now I see. And Jesus is the one that did it. In Luke 8, there, um, going back to Luke 8, there's a woman... Um, Actually, I'm not going back to eight. I'm going to another story. The, the woman at the well. When Jesus went to meet the woman at the well, remember she was, the Jewish people and uh, the Samaritans didn't even get along. Jesus talked to her like she was just like him. Jesus loved people. If you're an atheist and you don't like people that love people, I understand then. You wouldn't love Jesus. But okay, so that's all Bible stuff. And most, like I said, most atheists do not want to follow the scripture. So, um, and we talked about the martyrs and all the things that happened with them. Let's talk about today. Let's talk about today. There's millions and millions. Come on, you believe in science. If you're an atheist, you must believe in science. That's the only thing you believe in. You believe in science. Do you believe in math? One plus one equals always has, always will, never changes. Millions and millions of people throughout history have made claims about some kind of healing that Jesus did in their life. You can, you can take out a few and say, you know what, those are made up. But you can't take millions and millions and millions of 
these testimonies of people having these encounters with Jesus. You can't just say they all don't make sense. They're all fake. There's a story, and you can ask my wife, because when my daughter, uh, our firstborn, was, she had to have um, dental work done. All her teeth were decayed because she was born without enamel, um, being able to grow on her teeth. And, um, and the dentist had told us that um, we had to have surgery on all her teeth, her baby teeth. Again, baby teeth, $22,000. We barely had, we just had over $2,000 in our bank. $22,000. We don't have dental insurance. You tell my wife. Tell her. Say it to her. Say she's a fool for believing in Jesus. Because whenever she prayed to Jesus and she asked Jesus to provide, and then the, the dentist said, you know what I did? Because they never, they never approve it. It's never been done. It goes, but I do it just for formality. I sent your request for the dental work to your regular hospital, insur- your regular medical insurance. They don't, but he goes, I try it. He calls us up later and says, It's the strangest thing. They said they're paying for everything except for $2,000. I'm like, we have that in the bank. (laughs) Yes. You can't take that away. You may not believe in the Bible, but you can't take that miracle away. You can't take Jim Moreau's um, miracle away where he had to have a blood transfusion. All of his blood was taken out of his body. Another person's blood was put into his body. He now has 100% someone else's blood. You know what the odds are that that's going to work? And the odds are that you're going to find somebody with that perfect um, blood and the fact that your body has to accept it. You tell him that Jesus doesn't exist. You tell him that God um, doesn't exist and all this stuff is just by chance. All this stuff by chance. Or these medical doctors, they're the ones that did it. They're so smart. And I give them a lot of credit. They are really intelligent people. They do not make the miracles happen, though. They're fo- you know what doctors do and scientists do? They find out what God's already known for years. All they're, do- they're not inventing anything new. They're just finding out what God's already done. They save people's lives. Well, guess what? God's the one that gives that life. You're just continuing it. As as you're dealing with the not believing in God, you would have to take my testimony. And you would have to tell me that when I was in Hawaii and out in the ocean, and and, and I'm going to stop right there. And I feel for the families that we heard this, this just, I think it was today or yesterday's news, that at this one beach, I think it was six people, are, uh, mom and dad, mom and dad of six kids, that's how it was, mom and dad of six kids got caught in a rip current and did not survive. Six kids are without their parents. So I know everybody doesn't make it through this, but when I was in Hawaii, I remember, um, and, and you guys know this story, but I got to tell it to make this story make sense. Um, I was in Hawaii. I was not feeling well, but I went out anyway. I got caught, caught in a rip current, I mean, at least 100 yards away from shore, and I couldn't make it back in. All I wanted to do was wave to my wife and my daughter, and then um, Tina was um, pregnant with Hannah, which doesn't look like it now because she's much, much older now. <laughs> but you were just in the belly. Um, But I remember I just wanted to wave by. That was what I was thinking when I was going to die. I was too far out. I was too weak. My leg was cramped. Um, I did stupid things. I made stupid mistakes by swimming out there in the first place. It was all my fault. I just, I I shouldn't have did it. I was sick for that whole week. I should never went in the ocean in the first place. But in all that, I just wanted to wave to my wife and my daughter and say even by Hannah, (laughs) which would never know that I actually waved to her. But, But they weren't there. They had went somewhere else and, um. And I remember looking all around. I couldn't. I couldn't. And I remember God speaking to me. Now, if you're an atheist, this is weird to you because it's just a fairy tale story. It's all made up. Nobody can believe this stuff except for me. I 100% was there. 
I'm the witness. I witnessed it. It happened. <laughs> and if you knew how tired and weak I was, you would know there's no way I'm getting back to that beach. And um, God said to me in an audible inside voice, not an outside voice. It was inside. I, it, was, it was just there. It's like, look to the right. Now, I was angry. And I said, look to the right. I've looked everywhere. I've looked over there. I've looked over there. I'm going to die. But I did it anyway, and I looked over here, and there's two surfers out of nowhere. They were not there just a minute ago. There's two surfers out there. And I just yelled to them, I need help. And the one guy goes, what? <laughs> if I have to repeat this again, I'm going to go under. I said, I need help. And he came over, and I hugged that surfboard like um, I, I was. I think I probably have claw prints in there because I hugged that surfboard so much. It probably took him 20 minutes to get me in, and I just told him, thank you. I do know his name. Um, my kids continually ask me for that person's name. I never will tell the name because either that was an angel, and when I get to heaven, I'm going to know, or it was a person. And if that person ever comes up and says to me, hey, um, I'm the one that saved your life, I want to say, what's your name? And nobody else knows the name but me. <laughs> I've never told anybody the person's name. And I, it's, I say it might be an angel. Uh, you, you make your own decision. I watched them out there because I was going to give him money. I came back to the shore. I, I went and got money from my um, father-in-law. And I said, I don't have my wallet. Let me have some money. Whatever you got, I'm going to pay this guy for saving my life. I sat there on the beach and watched them. And then all of a sudden, they were gone. I'm like, okay. End of that story. Can you, can you tell me that was a fairy tale story? Can you say, oh, that just happened. It was coincidence. I'll tell you what. Let me go ahead and tell you. My leg was cramped. You can't swim with a cramped leg. You want to know something else I did? I told you I made a lot of stupid mistakes. I had fins on. You know what? I, I was so panicked out there. You know what they say in lifeguard? If you panic, you die. I panicked. There was something holding onto my foot, and I was upset. I was angry because it was holding me back. I couldn't swim with the stupid thing. It, was, it, it had gotten me so frustrated, I reached down and pulled it off. <laughs> it's my fin. That's how messed up I was. And then I couldn't get it back on because every time I put it back on, my face went in the water, and I wasn't going to do that. Go ahead and tell, tell the people that have went through miraculous things in their life, tell them, your God's not real. Those things are made up. That's a fairy tale. You can't take it away. You can't take my miracle away. You can't take my wife's away. And I know a lot of you, I know the miracles you went through. Craig, I'm going to call you out. Craig was on his, can I say deathbed? I went and saw you. you. Man, I have never seen a truck so messed up in my life. I've never seen anybody with pins in their head either. No, I mean, you were pinned. For you to be alive today, nobody can take that from you. Your praying wife and church family, I know the prayers were going around. And for you to today, you got to see the pictures of this guy. Semi-truck accident. Amazing. Three days later. Hey, that's what Jesus <laughs> you know what? I, I, I came and visited you that, that day, and um, um, yeah, I, I'm glad God answered prayer. <laughs> you can't take that away. See, atheists have a problem when they say they don't believe in the Bible. That's okay. So you don't believe in the Bible, but the work that the Bible does in people's life, you can't change that. You can sit there and say that's fairy, st fairy tale stuff all the time. But when you read the scripture and it happens in people's lives now, what do you do with that? Let me tell you something else. It's embarrassing when an atheist talks to me and we start talking about science. And um, not just me, but anybody. And then find out that what they believe for years and years by some teacher at school. Because that's where they get it most of the time. Is teachers from school or some professor at college. And um, I, my daughter goes to college. at a, It's supposed to be a Christian college. They get filled with this stuff. Fortunately, we have Dan and Gay who are scientists. <laughs> I love that. And they're like, hey, Grace, can, um, why don't you have a one-on-one -on -one meeting with me and let me tell you why your Christian beliefs in the Bible is wrong. This is at a Christian university, by the way. You're right. You're right. So weird. So they got non-Christians teaching science at a Christian college. 
So all she has to do is call Dan and Gay. Dan and Gay, uh, we, we get together and start giving her information. And you know what? The, these professors, they can't take that. This is other scientists who know as much or even more than they do that they've just been able to go through the textbook and say, Grace, look at this. But then you have facts from other Christians who are scientists. What does an atheist do with that? When there's a whole movie out there that takes away all of their science proof with other science proof. What am I saying this for? If you're going to not believe in Jesus Christ, fine. It's not my job to change anybody's life. So if you're watching online, I am not here to change your life. I just don't want you to be disappointed if you believe someone else who didn't even know anything. Ask them why they don't believe in Jesus in a way that they experience. See, I can, I can, I can get you massive amounts of Christians who have went through situations where they should not be alive where they went through financial um, problems and issues and God provided. Oh, yeah, I, I, I have probably 15 to 20 of my own that I put in every sermon that I can because I know it happened. And you know what? You know the way God proves it to us? This is how he does it. He puts it so you can't find a way out. Jim Monroe, he got cancer the way they said they're go he's going to die and they, don't, they can't heal him. That's what they said. Only person that can heal you is God. Only person that can provide your finances is God. The only one that can get you out of the mess you're in is God. And that's where God lets you get. But so you can't get out of it and say, oh, it was because of my friend. Or it was because of my wisdom and my knowledge. Or it was because of something that I did. No, God lets you get to a place that you have no other resources. So that means you are down and out and hopeless. Because he wants to do a miracle for you, but he does not want anybody else to get the credit. And he wants you to learn to trust him more and more and more. Being an atheist is harder than being a Christian in some sense because you've got to continually fight once facts are changed. or I mean, science right now in the biological community is changing. I mean, do you believe in um, male and female or a hundred other different genders? I mean, it's like, so if you're going to believe in science that way, I mean, how far are you going to go with this stuff? But as Christians, as believers, we have always stuck to the Bible. The Bible has not changed. Oh, wait a minute. Why does she have a different Bible than he does over here? Why the, See, before you ask those questions, start understanding what those different Bibles are. There's different translations. People go to the original, and they try to make it easier on this one or this language or however they... But the original Bible, original God's Word, has not changed. We try to make it easier for people. Like I'll give you an example. The word ass is in the Bible. So over time, they changed it to something else. Or trying, still means donkey. <laughs> it's just the way that we say it in our society. I think some version has the word bastard in there. Said that in church. Huh. It's in the Bible, one version. Obviously they changed that because of over time. The words, words change. People understand things differently. Don't sit there and say the Bible changed. No, it's just the way they, re, they, they translated it to modern um, understanding. You go to the original. The original is what matters. The original is correct. But I'll tell you this. Don't even go to, go to your Christian people who have experienced it. Do not go to someone who just sits there on Sunday morning in a church pew or church chair and think that they are the Christians. You go to somebody who has encountered Jesus Christ, who has went through trials and tribulations. You go through to someone like Jim Monroe, like Tina, like myself, like others who have went down and out with Jesus to where we would lose everything. But we had to trust Jesus. And he never fails. Ended up here, I, you know what, I, I'm not pushing against atheists because I think atheists actually ask the right questions. I just don't know that they have the right resources to get the right answers. I know they, 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 it gets into a, you get into a shell where you're only getting 
um, what you, you understand to be the truth. Anybody online, anybody here, if you have um, family members or people you know, have them call me, Dan, Gay, Tina. We together have so many resources that will help you at least with the information so you can make a logical decision between do you believe in a God that created everything or you believe in an explosion that creates chaos, yet miraculously everything ended up in perfect order. It's your choice. Um, but we would love to talk to you. We would love to help you. But if you're online or you're here, you just say, you know what? I'm going to give this a shot. Jim Monroe did it. He finally just said, God, prove yourself to me. You know what? That, what God wants that chance. Now watch what you say because right after that, Jim Monroe ended up with cancer and he had to go through a lot of things to say, you know what, God took me to a point he proved through this whole process that he existed. So it's better just to say I'm ready to accept Jesus right now. If you are, the Bible makes it really simple. It says if you will confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you will believe that Jesus came here to earth, died on the cross, um, raised from the dead, if you will believe that, it says you will be saved. What does that mean? That means that you're willing to take the lordship, the crown off of yourself, and turn it over to him and let him be the lord of your life. That's what that's saying. Instead of you making the decisions in your life, instead of you saying, I'm going to be the one that makes all my, I'm, no, you're saying, God, what do you want me to do? I turn my whole life over to you. And he loves you enough to make your life a much better place. Inside and out. You're going to love yourself a lot better. And people will too. Let's pray. Dear Lord God, we just thank you for what you're doing, God. I know, man, this message changed. So God, if it's somebody online, if somebody here, if maybe it's somebody that somebody tells somebody, whatever it is, God, use it. Because I definitely did not plan this sermon today. It was all you. And God, I just pray that I, I, I said the right things the right way and whatever else. But God, it's your words that count. It's your Holy Spirit talking to somebody's heart because, God, somebody has to get into the heart and disrupt it. They have to calm it down, God, and that can only be you. They have to make it willing to listen. God, so I just pray right now, whoever it is, God, that you will just speak to their heart and say, just give me a chance. Just listen and make a decision. We put those people in your hands right now, God. Pray all these things in your name. Amen.